Queen Elizabeth's funeral was the most watched event in human history, perhaps rightly so, as it represents the end of an epoch. But what is the epoch that follows it? And what was it that was buried yesterday? Hello there, you 5.9 million awakening wonders. Thank you for joining me on this voyage towards truth, where the light within us is nurtured, acknowledged, recognised and brought forth. If you don't subscribe yet, subscribe right now and please turn on the notification bell in case the algorithm of this platform is not in support of our beautiful, pure, clear agenda. Our agenda being to share truth with you, to continue to filter that truth, to recognise the difficulty of ever making a claim towards truth, an objective truth at least, and seeing if through discourse we can arrive at a place where we can trust one another and where we can and amend and alter the systems within which we live. Pretty ambitious, I would say, for a YouTube channel. Don't you reckon, guys? Let's talk about what happened yesterday. Queen Elizabeth II was buried and the British did what the British do best, put on some pageantry and some pomp. Now, even if you're an anti-monarchist, even if you're an anti-statist, even if you're a person who believes strongly that the world needs to be radically revised, in particular the way that power structures operate, the way that media operates, the way that politics operates, the impossibility of democracy as we understand it ever offering real power to real people. An event like this is designed to and will doubtlessly have on some level emotionally affected you. The great mother has died and is being buried. A new king is brought forth. Over the course of the day-long event, there'll be moments where you were personally affected, there'll be moments where you were emotionally, even spiritually affected by the events. Let's have a look at some of the stuff that went on. The death of a monarch is of course a political occasion because a monarch is a representative of power even though normally in our nation the Queen's power is uh, symbolic only. The fact is there's been loads of research and writing about this. She does have literal financial and legal power. Also the symbolic power is perhaps... A that's not an insignificant power, sim symbolic power. Joe Biden gets to travel in his own vehicle. The whole rest of the world has to go in buses. I mean, if you want a metaphor for whether or not America is a superpower, in case you need reassuring over there, guys, your leader, dear old Joe Biden, got his own vehicle. The rest of the world had to go in a bus. But on the downside, Joe Biden did need a stairlift and the rest of the world's leaders were able to get there using their own legs. these people getting all these medals that's what i always think is like what is that a medal for i know it's tony blair former british prime minister he had a medal on the size of a baked bean tin and my main memory of him is he sanctioned the death of a lot of iraqi children that's what the medal's for well done of course we are very sensitive about the millions of people that are feeling real grief at the death of a queen because her reign encompasses a period of time that's defining. We're going from literally from a time where pop culture and mainstream culture was emergent through the advent of television to this saturation point that we live within now, a point where we are literally culturally bewildered, where nobody knows what you're supposed to believe in anymore, what are the right words to say, you know, and some of that is, in my opinion, necessary adjustments that happen as cultures amend and become sort of more broadly awakened. But we no longer have a certain centrifugal figure around whom to gather and say, we are Britain, we are British, this is what we believe in. Those ideas have been diluted and have broken down to some degree for a good reason because there's no point in having an epitomising figure unless that epitomising figure is representative of values that are beneficial to the majority of people and that they constitute fairness, togetherness, unity. There's no doubt that the Queen in many people's minds and hearts represented precisely those values but practically it's unlikely that the institution of the monarchy helped to bring about fairness and justice because for example they own 6.6 .6 billion acres of land across the world. They're worth $28 billion. King Charles III will not pay inheritance tax. There's no way that those statistics, for example, are representative of anything other than elitism, privilege and institutional power. You can't help but notice, of course, on an occasion like this, and I would acknowledge that it was incredibly beautiful and moving, that it's 
ultimately about militaristic power, ultimately religious power, because it's in an abbey and the, the kind of the aesthetics and paraphernalia of the song and the music are to some degree religious. But significantly, the uniforms, the pageantry, the parades are about militaristic power. What is that telling you? This is power. Why is it power? Because if you don't agree with it, guess what's going to happen? The Queen's coffin was carried on a gun carriage. I mean, like, these are, in a sense, whilst they're symbols, they're also very literal image systems we're being presented with. If you do not respect the power of this institution, you will be killed. How we know that is the power of this institution was built upon killing people. And I'm not talking about, obviously, literally Queen Elizabeth II, although her reign encompasses numerous wars. And again, I'm not suggesting that she's politically responsible for those. I'm suggesting the hierarchy at which she sits at the top of is built upon the threat of violence and the use of violence in some cases, whether that's against a domestic population who may rebel and revolt against things like the poll tax, which is a kind of a tax system that was presented to us about 40 years ago that people rioted against, or, you know, unpopular foreign wars. The power of the crown is the power of an elite. That's what it is, essentially. It's the epitomising symbol of elitist power. Now, I don't think we'll ever see a funeral like this again. I don't think there'll ever be. I mean, think of the factors. She's female, so she lived longer. She ascended to the crown when she was very young. Charles, how long is he going to be king for? How long are people going to be persuaded that it's universally beneficial? The majority of people that are pro-monarchy will be older. I'm not saying there aren't young people, people that are in the services, people that are patriotic. And in fact, I'm sympathetic both to people in the services and people that are patriotic. But as a device for holding together a society, we probably are experiencing the twilight, I would say. Because, you know, throughout the rest of the world, this era is already over. In Russia, in France, in America, the idea of monarchy has been thrown off, I would argue, and been replaced by systems that are comparable, centralised forces that, though maybe electoral nominally in the United States of America, ultimately still privilege the same elites, what you would call the deep state, dark state, economic and financial power, families and institutions whose wealth and ability to influence aren't impacted by the mind the democratic fluctuations that occur in American politics or in Russia. You have a de facto tyrant like Putin who seems to be beyond the reach of electoral politics in Russia. You tell me in the comments below if you agree with this. What we have is a sort of a cartoonish version of feudalism that's meant to run parallel to democracy, but ultimately, I would say similar to the Russian and American models, is a kind of a veil that prevents people from recognising, hang on, does this benefit us more than it costs us? That's the question you have to ask about any system of power, If you are, unless you're one of the obvious beneficiaries. Does this benefit us more than it harms us? Do you think we'd be better to get rid of this? Now, a lot of people say no, because it gives us a national myth, it gives us cohesion, but... I would say that's an argument for how little trust and faith we have in the possibility of change now. And I think that's why it was such a morose occasion, because we recognise, don't we, that the old ideas are dead, dying, moribund, hopeless, but we don't know what's going to replace it. None of us are like, well, it's OK, because we've got these ideas now. We've got these systems. This is how we're going to prevent ecological meltdown. This is how we're going to marry together these diverse and oppositional cultures. This is how we're going to deal with trade more fairly. This is what we're going to do about the various immigration crises, the breakdown, the centralisation of power around finance, the corruption. But I would say that perhaps the reason these ideas are not emerging, because actually there are some ideas, but the reason these ideas are not being popular is precisely because of centralised power. Political, economic and media power collaborate in order to prevent these ideas becoming popularised. Not that I'm suggesting it's an easy thing to replace a hegemony. So I think that the sadness around the death of Queen Elizabeth II, the sadness of this occasion is because on some level around the world, even forget just British people, everyone feels like something is dying but the new thing is not yet born. When you see dear King Charles III trotted out, as a potential solution. It's a little bit like Joe Biden or Putin. You think, are these old guys going to cut it when it comes to the crunch? I don't think so, Mama. The soul of his servant, Queen Elizabeth, in the midst of our rapidly changing and frequently troubled world. 
Even I, with my sort of natural sense of inquiry and opposition towards established forms of power, on seeing that crown upon a coffin, felt like, God, I feel like I've seen her wearing that crown a bunch of times in portraits and on stamps and on money, and there it is. There is the inevitability. There is the ultimate humbling. In a sense, the Queen's funeral brings into sharp focus both the beauty, but also the absurdity of the institution, that there is all of this grandeur. There is this sense of something divine being alluded to, like some powerful force that underwrites Britain or whatever country you're into. But also that's a person who has died and was always going to die. And we have projected this omnipotence onto her. Again, uh, the military uniforms are significant. You kind of forget that these people have military histories. And if you're generally speaking a cynical person, you might think, has Charles done anything in a military situation to warrant that amount of military recognition? Because when you investigate people that have served and served hard, that, that kind of paraphernalia comes about as a result of risking your own life, saving other people's lives. And it's hard to imagine that anyone in the royal family is ever put in that position, isn't it? suppose many of the moments that you'll remember, you'll remember the moment where there was a spider, you'll remember the moment where the note was dropped on the floor because there's so many eyes on this thing. Every piece of minutiae is scrutinised. Many people don't recognise the British Prime Minister, Liz Truss. She's not been Prime Minister for very long. Who's this? No, hard to identify. Maybe uh, minor royals, members of the... I can't identify them we at this point. We can't spot everyone, no. unfortunately. The late, most high, most mighty and most excellent monarch. There are moments of genuine human sadness, seeing that coffin lowered. Any of you that have been to a funeral of a grandmother, grandfather, father, whatever, you can't help but relive that moment because there's a symbolic resonance. I also feel a human sympathy, obviously, for Charles looking at whatever remains of the ordinary human in there. And I don't mean that as a criticism in some sort of occultist way. I mean, this is a person who their whole life has been groomed to be in this position and to some degree prepared for this moment. But as any of you know who have experienced death, when the death actually comes, you're always hit by something, aren't you, that you just didn't prepare for. Like, I thought I was ready for that death, but this sneaky detail stitched now forever into my mind. Something about a teacup or some lost moment that resurfaced then. As a personal event, of course, you can do nothing but offer condolences and love. As a historic global death that is no doubt evocative of an era ending, you have to welcome and be open to whatever it is we're culturally being invited to participate in. You have to recognise this is a transition. There's a transition occurring now that's long been teased and preceded by the fracturing that's been occurring around the world. The sense of something shifting now, the tectonic plates are moving and we don't know how to respond. There are so many questions that have to be acknowledged and answered and I think our systems are incapable of addressing them. Just to see that many people being silent and being focused, I believe is moving, but it's been pointed out by the philosopher Brad Evans, that most people now are observing the spectacle through a device. And what a radical transition that is, that everything is mediated and filtered. Everything is already a social media event. The Queen is a symbol and the event is being further symbolised by your own detachment from it. Perhaps that's what this time is mostly defined by. Dislocation. Who are we now? What are the correct words to use to describe one another? What are the correct ways to relate to one another? How do we correctly evaluate our imperial history versus the value of tradition? How do we balance the rights of people to become who they truly believe themselves to be versus the rights of other people to practice orthodoxies that are just as meaningful to them? How do we have mutual respect for one another? How do we hold power to account without being 
blind to power's vast reach? How do we have a media that is properly funded but not corrupted by that funding? How do we ever again have something that resembles community and democracy? How do we have a parish, a community, common songs, common feelings while respecting the rights of other people to have their own songs and their own feelings? How can we ever do that again in a centralised culture? The death of Queen Elizabeth II is not the death of an individual. She was never an individual. Why she was great is because she recognised she was a symbol and she lived as a symbol. What that woman thought about, all I know is she liked dogs a bit. She liked horse racing. That's it. Like, what else do you know about her? You don't know anything about her. She functioned as a symbol. She wasn't, it didn't matter what her favourite colour was, what she was into in bed. Like, that's over. Charles, you already know that the dude left Diana, he was into Camilla. Conjecture. You couldn't conjecture about her. She was the perfect symbol for that age. She was the perfect sort of rainbow arc from the, an innocent time, relatively, into this time of saturation of image. And that's gone now. It's over. People will now mobilise to try to transfer those values onto subsequent figures figures and symbols to maintain the power structures that she so gracefully epitomised. So gracefully, in fact, that we didn't examine what was behind the crown and the ermine and the scepter. Now we will. Now we think, why is that power there? Why should we have these kind of institutions? Look, for a moment, just acknowledge that you don't even know who Liz Truss is. And that's the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. For a moment, look at dear Joe Biden playing with his tongue and doddering down aisles. That's the most powerful person in the world, apparently. Unless, of course, the presidential power is nothing compared to the corporate lobbyist power that's behind it, the military industrial complex power that's beside it. It's a confronting event. But an event, nonetheless, that the world's population sat and watched for a significant time in hugely significant numbers. And perhaps the reason we're drawn to it is because we know on some level something is over. We don't know what's going to replace it. We're being told what's going to replace it is Joe Biden, Putin, King Charles. But in our heart of hearts, we now know these ideas are not going to work. The Queen is dead. Long live. It's not King Charles III, is it? If not the last people, very Some, much the last people yeah, we were in the queue last night. What, what was that like? Amazing. It's the, I think it's the best thing I've ever done in my life. Even having my, my children, Lily and Luca, <laughs> I think this top that. One thing we all know is that there is a weight, a freight, a potency to this occasion. All of the people that queued up for hours just to walk past the coffin, there's something real in it. But we're not quite clear about what it is because there are so many narratives that surround the Queen. There are narratives around elitism, hierarchy, power, corruption, imperialism, colonialism. But there are also narratives around femininity, sanctity, the divine duty, uh, a willingness to serve. And none of these things are more true than any of the others. I suppose what we have to come up with as a culture, as a planet, as individuals, is a sort of a shared vision for ourselves collectively and individually. Sometimes it seems simple to me. Sometimes it's this. We're on a planet, a sphere, with a certain number of people and a certain number of resources. What is the best way for us to manage this? What stories do we need to tell ourselves and one another to make this work? And I think this is a time where we're going to have to radically revise what those stories are. For the preservation and survival of the planet, or the life on the planet, I should say, to be more specifically, and in particular human life. And um, what are we going to do now? What are we going to do now? It's pretty clear that an era is over, that the old narrative has died along with Queen Elizabeth II. And whatever new story... We're about to tell one another about who we are and where we're going. It's unlikely that it will be epitomised by the figure of King Charles III. But that's just what I think. Why don't you let me know what you think in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, have a look at either of these. Remember, turn on the notification bell because we make videos all the time. And sometimes the algorithm masks them from you, the swine. Please sign up to my mailing list if you'd like to know what we're up to. We do live events. We've got all sorts of interesting stuff we're doing. More important than any of this, though, is that you please stay free.